Hi everyone, welcome to Amapura Awakenings. Um, Spirit Talk with Nikki today. I thought I would do another one this week because on Sunday I did one and I had some really good questions that I wanted to try to um, that I wanted to try to answer today and then also any questions that come in from anybody watching. So I'm gonna give it a couple minutes just while some people join and we can get started. Tell me who's here. And my daughter Marissa is here with me again today. She's gonna to be moderating and sending some of the questions my way and helping me do that because I don't have my glasses on so I can't see anything that's coming up through the comments or anything like that. So I, I'm gonna depend on Marissa to help me with that. But welcome everybody who's here. So who's here so far? Um, I cannot tell okay. as of right now, but so far. Oh, uh, Trisha's here. Hi, Trisha. <laughs> And uh, there's 17. Uh, Matt is here. Okay, awesome. Well, everybody, it looks like we have some people joining, so I'm just going to kind of tell you a little bit about myself. Um, my name's Nikki, and I'm a spiritualist, and I have a lot of information that kind of comes to me through vision and through sessions that I have with people, and even in my own personal, um, personal experience with spirit. So I tried this talk on um, Sunday, and we got such really good questions and so much good interaction and fantastic things to think about. So I thought I would do it again today, again, once again, to address that. So what I'm actually going to do is I'm going to um, ask you to feel free to send any of the questions that you have for me um, or for Spirit. And I, if, I, if they're very, very personal, I might not address them right now on a live. You can always schedule a session with me or I can try to answer them um, at a later time, maybe tomorrow, tonight or tomorrow. But I had a really good question come in um, on Sunday that I wanted to take a second to address. And the reason that I wanna take a little bit of time is because A, I thought it was a really fantastic question, and B, there's a little bit, it goes a little bit more in depth than just a simple answer. So. Naomi had asked a question on Sunday that says, can we hold our trauma in our bodies? Um, and if we, can't, if we do, how do we release it? And I really thought that was a fantastic question. I've actually um, taught some workshops on this concept of how we hold trauma in our bodies and where the trauma exists. And that's a quite an involved process. So what I wanna do is I wanna try to kind of summarize it a little bit just to give you an idea um, how it kind of works. So thinking of trauma in the body, we have to think about first uh, all the bodies that are affected by trauma. So we have to identify how many bodies do we actually have and actually we have five bodies. Now just to keep in mind, I have a little, a few notes over here on the side that goes a little bit through the workshop that I teach on this. So I just am going to be referring over to the side just so I can make sure that I cover the different points that I want to. Um, from that. So we do have five bodies. We have a physical body, a mental body, um, an energy body or an emotional body. We have a transition body and we also have a bliss body. So each of those bodies represents something. Now the physical body is kind of like the hardware. It's, it's the vehicle for the divine. It's how our spirit can connect to us. We have a physical body. So if anybody in heaven wants to talk to us, our body is utilized in connection with spirit. Um, this part of our body, when it becomes blocked, that's where we tend to hold the trauma, is in the physical part of the body. That's when we start to figure out something's going on because my body doesn't feel good. So we know that the end result of anything that we hold within ourselves from a traumatic experience is going to reside in the physical body. It may not come from the physical body unless you had like an accident or something. That would be a physical body connection. The mental body is where we process everything in our brain and everything in our experiences. So first we have the physical body and extending from that we have the mental body. This is where everything that happens on earth we have to process in our mind. The next body out is going to be our emotional body. And the emotional body is where we process everything that occurs in an emotional way. The next body out is our energy body, or that is our, our transition body. So if you've ever heard of somebody going through that tunnel of light, what happens in this, in, this, in this body, in this transition body, this is where we shed the ego self. So a lot of people 
will describe that when they pass away or when they have those near-death experiences, they go through a tunnel of light. And it's actually just this, that tunnel of light is actually just that your spirit is awakening to a complete consciousness of spirit, in turn shedding the, the human consciousness. Because the human consciousness is comprised of conditionings and experiences that happen in our life that form our, our, our human mind or our human consciousness, when we hit that fifth body, that transition body, this is where we're predominantly and dominantly spirit, although we're holding a little bit into that um, spirit, into that physical world. So think of the transition body kind of like when you dream and you have a dream, you're actually in the middle. You're between the human self and the spirit self, and that's the transition body. That's our fourth body. Our fifth body is where the release of the ego has already occurred, and this is just spirit. This is only spirit. So think about every single experience that you have in your life is going to have to process through each of these bodies. So if you have an experience that happens on earth and it's just, let's say it's a car accident and we have a car accident, that's our first body experience, car accident. When we move that to the second body, which is our mental body, think about what happens in the mental body based on a car accident. Well, you think about it and you know, you have that crash and you're like, oh my gosh, whose fault was that? Was that my fault? Was that their fault? Do they have insurance? Do I have insurance? Should I call the police? Are they gonna call the police? So your mind starts really processing that physical experience in your life. Now from that experience, it's gonna move into the next body, which is the emotional body. And I could go on here for a long time, but I'm not going to. I'm just gonna say that that experience will, will come into your emotional body. Our goal is to take anything on earth and transcend it to heaven. So we should be able to climb through that experience of the car accident. But maybe we cover all those things, right? We cover everything about the car accident, but when we go to get in the car on Monday morning and our rental car, because our car is totaled and we get that panicky feeling, like that anxiety that happens, that's because the emotional body did not process that experience of the car accident very well. So now you're gonna hold the trauma of that car accident and the heart chakra, and then you're not gonna be able to get to the transition body where you're actually able to release that experience. Let's say you get in the car on Monday morning in your rental car and all you can think about is, where's my paperwork? What if there's an accident? What if something happens? And you start to go into this mental sort of um, experience about the car accident that happened on Friday. So now you're gonna start to hold on to that mental trauma from that experience and that will limit you from even be able, being able to know what you feel about it. So that would indicate a place where you may have a block there and that's where you could hold on to these um, specific traumas. As you go through your life, every if you don't transcend those, Every single time you have an experience that could trigger one of those places that was blocked up, that you weren't able to transcend, it's gonna hit that original place. So if you had the accident and it's your mental body that was struggling with the accident, then that's where you're gonna hold your trauma. So maybe two years later or three years later, you can't think straight or you're confused, you can't make a decision, you don't know what to do, so you notice that your mental capacity kind of is not working well. If you keep going back and forth between the mental body, the emotional body, and the physical body, this, this repetition of trying to transcend something is how we actually hold that trauma in the body. And there's ways to get through that, but I just wanted to answer the question and say yes, we can hold trauma in the body. The way that trauma enters the body is by getting, not being able to process either that um, physical experience, the mental experience, and the emotional experience, kind of find an agreement in all of those places, become at peace with whichever way you have to do that. Now, some people come to see me because they're stuck in the mental body or they're stuck in the emotional body, and that repetition has caused physical experiences, back aches and fibromyalgia and arthritis and digestion issues and headaches and migraines and we can alleviate all of those kinds of things if we can identify the trauma and identify where we're actually holding it in our body and then identify the actual point 
that that was actually held in your body. And I will leave it at that because that would be a whole other experience and explanation uh, to go through that. So we can start answering some of the questions that are coming in if there are any. Yeah, there are a ton. Okay, okay. so just um, pick one. <laughs> okay, so I, uh, Nikki Anderson asked, with the veil being so thin on Halloween, can we communicate easier with our loved ones? I kind of figured since it's Halloween. Yeah, that's a really actually great question because I know people talk about the veil and the veil is getting thinner. But and when we just bring that into oh, a little and real bit. real quick, mm -hmm. Megan Smith also kind of plays off of that question mm -hmm. and she asks, how does it, uh, what does it mean and how does it affect those born when the veil is thin? So okay. kind of ties in. So when we think about the veil and how people often talk about, the, oh, the veil is getting thinner, we can communicate with our loved ones, we can see into the future and things like that, there is no separation in spirit. So when we are fully in spirit, everything that spirit is, is what we experience. So when we talk about a veil, what are we really talking about? The thing that blinds us to the truth. That's the veil. The thing that blinds us to the truth. What is the thing that blinds us to the truth? It is our physical experience, right? It is our willingness to go beyond our ideas, our perceptions, our opinions, our conditionings, the teachings of what our parents or the church or, or what society says that we're supposed to be. We mold our humanity into these pieces of education that happen in our life. And so oftentimes when we function in the world, we are functioning from within those opinions and conditionings. And oftentimes in order to do that, we have to quiet down that inner voice and we have to quiet down the spirit self inside of us. When we do that, we start doing that usually at a very young age, around five to seven years old, we start to quiet that voice. Now the reason that the veil is so thin when we're little kids, and little kids see angels and they see grandma and papa in heaven, and they talk to them and they play games with them, and you say, oh my child is obviously talking to the angels or obviously talking to my grandma or oh my goodness my three-year-old knew exactly who papa was but they never met papa you know on earth and we identify that to say that the veil is thin but the veil is thin because they're void of opinion the child is void of opinion they are void of ego they're void of conditionings so therefore everything that the spirit is is what they are welcome in so the veil is um in my opinion it's only the limitation of how far we are able to surrender to the inner voice of our soul because if we did most of our opinions would not be valid and then we would have uh, a very um, a very open doorway to communicate with our loved ones in heaven and our family and friends um, that are in heaven and even our own soul and our angelic team and our angels and all of the above so when we think about, well, will the veil be less on you know, October 31st? Sure, because collectively, a whole society of people start to think about the dead. A whole society of people are willing to accept in their life some spooky sensation about a spirit turning on or turning off a light. So when people are excited about Halloween coming, a lot of times it's because they themselves are open to the experience of having the veil be thin. So the veil is thicker for each person depending on their ability to connect with their own spirit outside of their ego. And that's the die before you die. You know, try to transcend, like I said in the first explanation about holding trauma in the body is to try to transcend those experiences so that we're viewing it from an altered perspective of spirit instead of a conditioned experience of earth. So I like to pay attention on November 1st, not so much because of Halloween, but more because it's All Souls Day. And I, it's where I have a fun time with the Halloween or the All Souls Day perspective. I don't really look so much at the, um, all, at the Halloween perspective as I do with the All Souls perspective. And that's where I and my family and in our culture, we like to honor the dead and we like to 
give them the human things that we like that they like so you know my daughter created a little altar for the people that we love and she put special things that they enjoy there and so that's our reaching out to the spirit world and remembering them and trying to draw their energies toward us well people use that as certain days of the year Halloween or All Souls Day or Christmas or Thanksgiving or Easter so if we make that a regular practice in our every day and not just wait for that one or two times during the year the veil for us will become thinner and thinner and thinner if we seek it we find it Marissa has a tattoo on her arm that says for those who seek him find him it's from Mary Magdalene's gospel uh, verse 822 and it's true if you look for it you'll see it you'll find it next question okay um, it says Tammy asked what does it mean when you see a person that looks just like your mom but your mom passed years ago and this woman has the same name as your mom I believe this was actually a question the last time mm -hmm. we kind of covered that that's something I call a body jump where your family or friend in heaven will try to get your attention to let you know that they are in your presence and they initiate in your presence so their their soul is connected to your soul and if they want to get your attention to let you know that they're there or if they have a message for you they can take their soul and kind of put it right next to the soul of another person and that could be the lady that is looks like your mom and has the same name as your mom right they that she may have chosen that person so that when you look at that person even though it's an independent person what you're connecting with is the soul of your mom and because your mom chose somebody that looks like her and has the same name as her that will open your eyes to look past the human representation of that person but to kind of seek that um, spirit connection with your own mom so that's happened to me a couple different times I met a lady a while ago she might be watching so you know who you are if you're on hi she I met her the first time and oh my god she looked just like my mom and my mom had been in heaven for a while this was literally years ago and I was doing a gallery session and she was there and the whole time that she was there I was just like oh my god she looks just like my mom and what that helped me to know is that because she looked like my mom and I felt my mom and I couldn't think of anything but my mom when I looked at her I knew that my mom was letting me know that she was with me at that gallery and that that was her way of making a connection to me and just a little while ago maybe like um, less than three weeks or a month ago I had a session with a woman and her name was Mary Lou that's my mom's name so when she contacted me to have the session and I was putting her information into my calendar and I saw her name was Mary Lou I just immediately knew I was like hi mom nice to talk to you today and then I just kind of spent some time with myself in reflection about my mom and that was great and it impacted me so much because I kept waiting for the day to have the session with this lady because her name was Mary Lou and in part of that session I recognized some of my mom's intonation when she said a couple things to me I was like oh that was for me oh that was from my mom so listen carefully when people are looking like your family members in heaven or they're talking to you because that's there's a part of you that is recognizing that their presence is with you so that's actually really beautiful I'm happy that happened for you okay next question question are we doing personal you can ask and, and I'll okay. see if I can answer it all right Jillian asked um, when we talked last time I asked about my job at the doctor's office I just want to ask my grandma if I should go back to daycare and the last name is uh, Betty Chino okay that is probably um, well let me see what's her name uh, her name is Jillian uh, Bettichino. Okay, and can you read me the question one more time? Uh, when we talked last time, I asked about my job at the doctor's office. I just wanted to ask my grandma if I should go back to daycare. What do you mean go back to daycare? Uh, I don't know. That would be a better question for a one-on-one -on -one session so I can get a little bit more information 
in order to do that. Uh, to answer that question, but I can answer it in more of a general way when we're talking about the decision-making process. So I'm just going to answer that in more of a more of an overall way. So when we make decisions and we have to figure out what is the best decision for us to make, we want to incorporate all three parts of ourselves. Okay, so we have, you know, the the Bible in Genesis 26 it says that we're created in the image of God. So that gives us three parts of ourself that we should be reflecting on a human self, a spirit or God self, the higher self, and the healing self or the Holy Spirit self. So if we're Christian or Catholic, um, we can go along the lines of believing that the Bible says that we're three things. If we don't wanna look at the Bible and acknowledge that we're three things and we're scientific, maybe we agree with Sigmund Freud who says that we are the id, the ego, and the superego. We could also agree with spiritual people who think we're mind, body, and soul. We could also agree with people that provide therapy, um, psychological therapy for people because those people s tend to suggest that we are analytical, physical, and emotional. So that means there's three parts of ourself that when in making any decision, we want to make sure that there is an agreement between what I think about this situation, what I feel about this situation, and what is actually doable for this situation. What can I do? So let's say that I have an experience where um, my, my job, and I want to... Uh, uh, no, I can't come up with an example because that would be too specific and I would have to get into too many specific things. So when you're making your decisions, as long as what you think, what you feel, and what you do are all aligned and there's no discrepancy between all of them, then that's good. So let's say a friend of mine wants me to do something. And in my brain, that sounds like a great idea. Maybe she wants me to go to a concert. Well, just to give you pre information i really hate going to concerts I, I really don't like them so but my friend is really excited about it and she's like oh my gosh you want to go to this concert and my mind is like yeah definitely i'm in the moment i will agree to go to the concert with her so that means my mind agrees so i can answer right wrong because the next place i have to visit myself is in the heart do i want to go to the concert my brain thinks it's a good idea will my emotions think this is a good idea on that day? No, because I don't like concerts. So then I have to decide what am I gonna do about it? I think I should be authentic and tell her the truth and the action I'm gonna take is not to go because my brain wants to go for her but I really don't wanna go. So if I go, then I'm going in contradiction because I'm, I'm not in balance. I don't have agreement in all three parts of myself. So as long as you can find that balance, then you're good to go with whatever decision you make. Okay, hopefully that answered your question. <laughs> okay, so for whatever reason, it um, decided to stop showing a lot of the questions. So okay. there's some above that I can't see now for okay. whatever reason. Okay. Um, so the next question that I can see is mm -hmm. from Megan Smith. She okay. asked, can you discuss soulmates slash twin flames and their significance? Oh, soulmates. Okay, here's my belief. I believe that there is a big, huge misconception about soulmates. You know, we spend our life and we are seeking this soulmate. And we have thousands and thousands of soulmates. What a soulmate actually is, is when one soul recognizes another soul. That's what that means. It's a soulmate. If you're sitting next to somebody on the bus or on the train on your way home, they are your train mate. They're your train mate. You sit next to them, you see them, you recognize them. So maybe you're not best friends with them, but you see them once in a while on the train, so you know who they are. You've seen them before. This is what a soulmate is. Somebody that you potentially have shared another lifetime with, that you knew in a previous existence of your soul, where you were another body but the same soul, these are soulmates. They are everywhere. So you might not want to marry everybody you consider was a soulmate because a soulmate can be somebody that just waves at you and makes your day better, right? So soulmates are the general population of spirit. Just like we have a general population of humanity, 
We have a general population of spirit. Every human body has a spirit. So when you're looking at soulmates, what you're asking is, does my soul know you? Does my soul recognize your soul? Have we shared a time together, right? And now when that happens, it's almost an unexplained type of scenario. And I feel that sometimes people get confused on what they identify to be a soulmate because they found somebody that's a good earth mate, right? A soulmate is somebody that is really activating your upper points of energy, a soul to soul connection. You might hear each other, you know, you might be thinking of them right at the moment that they call you on the phone. That means your souls are connected, that you know one another. But sometimes if you get along with somebody really good, you might assume that they are your soulmate, that you must have known them in another lifetime. But actually, those people are most predominantly your earthmate. These are people that you can acclimate well in the world with. It means that your human conditioning and their human conditioning has rendered two personalities that get along well, that have the same values or concepts or behaviors, and they can handle each other. These are earthmates. So when people find you know, that they go out to dinner and they go on a date or they're dating somebody that everything just feels so normal and so natural, um, where does it feel normal and natural at? Right? Is that at the level of your soul connection or is that at the level of we get along good, we like the same foods, we have the same things? That's an earthmate. Most people acclimate better with their earthmate, right? Because they're learning about each other and they're connected to each other in the growth of their own self humanly. Earthmates grow together. They learn together. This is innocent love that you meet, you get married, and you learn, you grow up together. You change while you're with each other, meaning that new conditionings happen and you grow with each other. Soulmates, soulmates, when they are people that aren't just the casual soulmate, but more of an, uh, more of a connected soulmate, somebody that you might enter into a relationship with. Those are not easy relationship, folks. Those do not happen easy because a soulmate is supposed to rip away your ego. It's your soulmate. It's somebody who says, I know your soul, and I'm sorry if your dad did that to you in this lifetime, but don't you remember the last lifetime? You didn't have any of these issues at all. So I'm not going to entertain this conditioning that you have and I'm going to rip your ego right away from you. And all those opinions and conditionings that you have, soulmates are not easy relationships. And they're not always indicated that you should marry them or you know, know them for the rest of your life. A soulmate comes usually to help you transcend from our first question transcend an experience in your human life that limits you, manipulates you, makes you make decisions based on that daddy issue, mommy issue, work issue, when I grew up everybody treated me like this issue. That's, that's what a soulmate does. A soulmate exhausts you of all the reasons that you can't listen to your own soul. And people don't like their truth. So most of the time, the person that's your soulmate that's gonna come in to rip all that out, that's a really difficult relationship. And if you can stick it out, then yeah, that's a forever type of thing. Um, so that's what I believe soulmates to be. Twin flames. Twin flames, people want to glorify into an idea that this is the person you should fall in love with for the rest of your life. And that's that one twin flame. And I know that that's a romanticized idea and understanding. And, and I'm not saying I'm right. I'm just saying that based on my experience when I was so seeking my twin flame or my soulmate, what I came to understand is that my twin flame is my own humanity. Right? It is, they describe a twin flame to be someone that in your life, has a very same mission as you for God. That's your twin flame. Somebody that vibrates, that, that, that knows every intricate detail, accepts it, loves it, and oh, it all becomes so beautiful. Why is something not beautiful? It's only not beautiful because we're in an argument with our own self. 
So the first and eternal relationship that you have while you are on this earth is your own human self and your soul. So if you want to know on this earth who is your twin flame, it is the relationship that you share with your own soul. And if you can express your soul through your physical body, right, that represents you, the flame of your soul comes out. And that's the light, you, the light that you are. So your twin flame is yourself. Alrighty, so there's a really uh, hot question that some people have commented on. Okay. Um, Kathy asks, I'm feeling disconnected with spirit and lack of a path aside from general prayer and a session with you. What is the best way to connect or hear from our own soul or loved ones in heaven? Oh, that happens to me all the time. You know what this is? This is you're in waiting mode and let me explain that. So we could go through our life where we're having like all these great connections and we're talking to our family and friends in heaven and we feel very connected to our own inner self. And that relationship is going fine. We might be getting visions. We might just know when things are gonna happen. We think we have a little bit of psychic ability and then all of a sudden it stops. And when this happened to me after my awakening, I got concerned. And what I, I would, I would think God was mad at me. I was like, God, are you mad at me? Like, why isn't anybody in heaven talking to me this week? Like, where's my mom? Where's my grandma? And it, and it would cause me that feeling of disconnect and that feeling like everything in me kind of felt a little stale. Like I didn't have any life force in me. Like, where was it? And so I understand your question and that, that, that disconnect from spirit is usually an indication that our spirit is stepping back, not disconnecting because our spirit is always with us, but kind of stepping back and letting you become the dominant um, driver of this, of today. So when we don't have the connect with our spirit and we feel a little separated, what that usually indicates is you haven't lived up to yourself. You told yourself to clean the bathroom last week and you haven't cleaned it and you're, you're getting your intuition and all of life is fine. I find that the disconnect happens when we don't continue listening to our own soul. And we think this has to be in huge moments of our life, in church, in a meditation, uh, when we're trying to obtain intuition or connect with somebody in heaven, then we're 100% willing to listen to our visions and our soul and our mind, but are we as willing to listen to our soul when we're laying on the couch watching TV and all we're thinking about is the TV show and that thought pops into our head from our spirit into our third eye or into our crown that says, do your laundry. You know, while you're watching TV and you're really engaged and you hear, do your laundry. What happens when that happens? Do you say, ah, I'm tired, I'll just do it tomorrow. Um, if you do that a lot, your spirit's gonna stop talking to you until you accomplish the things that you promised yourself you would do. So I have found that when I am blocked or that I am not feeling connected to my spirit, I usually look around my house and go, what did I tell myself I was gonna do that I haven't addressed? Maybe it was my bills, maybe it was go for a walk around the block, maybe it was do my laundry, it could be any number of things. Maybe it was call the doctor, make an appointment, you haven't been feeling well today. But these are usually connected to the inner conversation that we have with ourselves, because your spirit can never disconnect from you. It's just, can you hear your spirit? And if you can't hear your spirit or you're not getting those inner impressions, then why is the veil that you have so thick? What part of you are you not taking care of? So if you start to take care of those daily impressions that your spirit gives you, those things like, Oh, that napkin is on the floor. Pick it up. Or, you know, your, your to-dos. You have to complete your to-dos. You have to live up to the promises that you told yourself you were going to do. And when you do, your spirit will kick in and start talking to you again because then she'll have new opinions, right? So think of your spirit like your best friend. If you ignore your best friend or your child and you don't pay attention when they're asking you a question and you never answer them and you never do what they asked you to do, how long are they going to be your friend? How long are they going to talk to you? So a lot of times that is a cause of our own doing just because we kind of step away from honoring ourselves, nurturing ourselves, and living up to the things that we expected of ourselves 
Um, maybe we expected something to be done by Friday and we let it go. Um, now we are a little blocked. Well, go do the thing you said you were going to do and then you'll be unblocked. And I found that to be the best practice in getting back connected to your spirit. If you're looking for how and where did the block occur or how can you just you know, you have a thousand things to do on your list so you can't possibly accomplish them, what do you do then? Well, then you wanna do something physical, maybe go to the gym, maybe work out, and you wanna kinda of calm your physical body. If it's more that you are experiencing some dominant emotional things and that's why you may feel blocked from your spirit, using creativity, doing a craft, or doing something that involves a creative mind, that really eases the emotional self. So if you do practices like that, something physical or something creative, that also has the potential to unite your soul and your body. And in uniting your soul and your body, you can kind of awaken that relationship again. For me, I have often found that prayer really, really works for me. Some people use meditation as working for them, but that's another approach to try to identify where the disconnect is actually happening and you can going back to an earlier question about our different five bodies you may be able to even determine um, just understanding that information where that disconnection is happening i hope that answers your question um in tie with that can anxiety and depression cause a disconnect from your spirit amanda wants to know and kayla wants to know um, can anxiety and depression. Oftentimes, people that experience a high level of depression or anxiety are actually in a high, very heightened communication with their own spirit. If we think about the way that um, our spirit communicates with us, the way that our mind works, we get an impression and that impression kind of sits here. Um, if we take action on that thought, that means we get the thought and we do the thing, we do the action. And that's actually what most people try to do, right? Sorry about my doggies. We try to get uh, an idea and then we try to take action on it, but as we go to manifest it, it might get stuck here. And, and, and here we're visualizing other things like, oh, but if I do that thing I wanna do, I imagine that my girlfriend or my boyfriend or my child, they might be mad at me. So now I'm gonna stop that communication here. And let's say that's something you really, really wanna do, but you don't do it because of somebody else. Now keep reliving that every day, every day, every day, where the thoughts that come to you about honoring yourself or being kind to yourself get complicated or you talk yourself out of it. That means that your soul tried to use your brain, tried to use your visualization. You might even talk about that experience with a friend and say, well, I really wanna do this, but I know if I do this, this person's gonna get mad. And if they get mad, then so see, you'll even talk to somebody about it. So that means that whatever it is that's causing you depression or anxiety, it had three places to stop. Your thoughts, your imagination about those thoughts, your communication about those thoughts that you imagined might go a certain way. So now that's it, that's where the information stops, right after you talk about it, because the very next place for it to go is your heart. So if you haven't made that, that um, conscious um, ability to like kind of go through that and take action on it, and actually if this is what I wanna do, what is the most pleasing way to manifest on earth this thing I wanna do? So if it gets stuck anywhere, um, you might feel what you think is anxiety because the next point of energy down is your heart chakra. So it might palpitate, it might clench, you might get a shortness of breath. So let's say you bypass that. Let's say you get through it, you do deep breathing, you're totally through that anxiety, you know the next place it's gonna hit is gonna be your solar plexus, which is in your stomach. So now you're gonna get butterflies in your stomach, you have to run to the bathroom, you're gonna feel like, you know, cramping in there, and then it hits there. And if it keeps going, then you're gonna have stress in your relationships because it's gonna turn into the sacral energy, then it's gonna involve other people around you. So traditionally, when we have anxiety, it's normally because our spirit wants to tell us something, 
she or he probably told us a bunch of times and we keep talking ourselves out of it so as we do it just keeps going down and down and down and down into all of our points of energy and that may be a cause of our anxiety now there is anxiety that's created through the physical body. You can probably go get a blood test, see what your adrenal gland function is, see what's going on with, you know, what if you have low iron? When my daughter had low iron, she has heart palpitations, feels a high level of anxiety. That's a physically caused um, response, right? To low iron is to feel anxious. So the first thing that we wanna do to try to settle our anxiety or our depression is to first figure out, is this a physical experience? Am I sad because my thyroid is off? Am I, you know, am I anxious because my adrenal glands are off? So always address the physical body when you're thinking about anxiety or depression because we wanna make sure it's not our physical body. If it's our physical body, we can fix that. If it's not our physical body, we have to do a little bit more research and if it is your physical body and you don't check it, then you're gonna think you're crazy because you're gonna be trying to solve something and it's your thyroid that's off, right? So make sure you go get your blood tests and see your doctors and make sure that it's actually not your physical body that's creating that. Then we have a place to investigate. Then we have a place to pay attention. And where we wanna do that is by making sure that we're able to coordinate the thought in our brain um, void of the imagination of how that will impact everybody else because eventually if you can't process that it will affect everybody else that you are in connection to um, I hope that answers your question yep. okay um, we are at 41 minutes almost 42 minutes okay as long as we stop at about seven about seven. At seven, we have so to stop. about nine more minutes. Okay, then. so we have about ten more minutes, guys. Um, so next question. Next question is from Sophia Padilla. She mm -hmm. asked, I see something small and white dro drop from my home ceiling, usually at door entrances, but when I look down, there is nothing. What does this mean? Ooh, you have protection. Actually, that's incredible I actually do a practice to try to have that happen when we do when you do a blessing in your home if you put three pillar candles by the front door um, that's uh, for the Father for the Son and for the Holy Spirit it's like a blessing on the home it's like a protection on the home so actually that would indicate that your spirit guide of divine timing and protection which actually for you is either a father or a grandfather um, that comes from him because I have a real strong male connection that is like a father figure to you. So that would be a dad or a grandpa. And he actually is your protector, um, kind of like the matriarch of the family, the one that everybody would actually think is the matriarch of the family. And he literally, that's a protection on your home. So if you see that, you just know that your home is protected, that St. Michael is there, that your family and friends in heaven, nothing. Darkness cannot enter light. It just can't. It can't come into the light. And um, no darkness can get into your house. So that's awesome, actually. I love that. Okay. Right. That's really awesome. <laughs> <laughs> ha! Um, next question. I'm looking. Um, Tanya wants to know, what scares you in all the chaos going on in this world? What scares me in the chaos of this world right now is people's inability to recognize the quality and the beauty and the love that is their soul. That they are so compromised by the fear, by the judgment, by their own human conditioning, that they neglect to hear the voice in their soul. Not the voice in their pocketbook, not the voice in their 401k, not the voice that says that, well, that's just the way people act. Not, that is the most distressing thing because this is, this time of our life is not about a pandemic. It is not about an election. It is about our ability to recognize who we are. I'm so distressed 
because I know that if people saw, if they recognized, if they honored their own soul, there would be no ability for us to be in the position that we are um, politically, mentally, physically. These experiences, even if they're difficult, they would not be so hard to go through. They wouldn't be hard to move through. The way that people are making decisions in this recent time of our life is based on individuality, not unity. And if we really pay attention to the quality of our soul, what is it that so many spiritual mystics and teachers say to one another? What do they say to humanity? They go like this and they say, Namaste, Namaste, which means I honor the part of you that's exactly like me. That's your soul and my soul. That's not my dad was a jerk when I was little or your mom treated you bad or you grew up poor so you really like this guy who's gonna make our stock market big. It's not about that. And that is the thing that saddens me most because I see the beauty that you are and then I see the fear that comes from the world, the conditioning, the opinions, the way you're raised, that you forget who you are and that the veil is so damn thick that you can't see the part of yourself that is your neighbor. Maybe I should end here. Thank you so much for joining. I hope everybody has a lovely night. Listen to your soul and we'll find each other. Good night.